Hi, I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Wise Girl, and I have a really special guest here today, a bit of an unusual guest, if you will, my friend Christian McBride. He is a six-time Grammy Award-winning bassist. He's an amazing composer, arranger, musician, went to Juilliard, has played with everyone uh, under the sun from Kathleen Battle and Renee Fleming, Chris Bodie, Wynton Marsalis, Herbie Hancock, Diana Krall, Pat Metheny, Anybody that you want to know in the jazz world and in the pop and music world and beyond, Christian McBride, welcome to Wise Girl. Thanks so much for joining us. What an honor to see you and speak with you again, Francesca. It's been a long time. You know, it has been a long time, and it's so um, it's so fun. We met when I went to one of your shows. Uh, right. was at, the at, jazz at, at Birdland. At Birdland, okay. And then you came on my show when I was hosting uh, a TV show uh, right. last news weekend. And we just sort of stayed in touch. And you, you, you also bought my poetry books, which I thought was really sweet and generous of you from artist to artist. Well, you know, when I knew that you were a, uh, a, a news anchor and then I saw all this other stuff that you were doing, I, I had to support that. I have to support all my artist friends, all my poets, all my uh, visual art friends. Um, Got, got to support the art form. I really appreciate that because I think that art is one of those ways in which we can come together in a way that oftentimes we can't do when we're just trying to always figure things out with yeah. every rational, you know, sort of thought. You know, those are important, but they're, they're not ruling the world. So, you know, I've been on the mindfulness tip of late. Oh, hey, hello, your cat's back there. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> they, they think they're the star of the show. That's, yeah, Maggie and Penny. And I actually did one Aww. interview recently where um, my guest's cat went and sat on his computer and on his lap in the middle of it. So I just say it's a big party, you know. There you go. Just uh, enjoy the show, whatever it is. They're, <laughs> they're doing their thing. I won't bother them if they don't bother us. So. <laughs> It's, it's life, you know, we have to be supported by whatever spirits and uh, whatever energy support us, right? There you go. That's exactly right. So let's talk a little bit about um, music um, and, 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 and mindfulness, if you will. I, I was yes. explaining to you that I had been at a retreat with George Mumford, who is the mindfulness coach to the uh, athlete stars, if you will, the, the, the Michaels, the Kobe's, uh, you know, has worked with Phil Jackson over the years. And he was talking about being in flow, which is also known in the music world as being in the pocket. And yes. To, and I witnessed you be so deep in the pocket with your homies doing your thing. Um, and I love it. And, and other musicians, too, that are really into what they do and good at it. Talk to me about what that experience is like. And where are you when you're doing that kind of music and that flow? Oh, that's a good question. I think that uh, when you're creating any sort of art, you know, be it poetry or, or if you're painting or if you're creating music, um, it's important that you do your best to um, have all of your vistas wide open. You have to be influenced by everything around you. Uh, the idea of controlling something or controlling a moment to me is a little bit overrated because if you try to control everything, uh, I mean, it's okay to keep a little bit of control, like some self-control maybe, but um, I think if, if you're uh, creating art, if you're trying to communicate to people, um, it's important that you have empathy, it's important that you have sympathy, it's important that you're, you're, you're wide open to everything that's going around you. People used to ask this question of, what do you want people to feel when they hear your music? And um, I used to have an answer of like, oh, well, you know, I want people to feel happy or I want them to feel this kind of thing. But there, I, I realized that uh, I can't really control what people feel when they hear my music. So I just hope they feel something whatever it makes them feel, whatever kind of emotion the music makes you feel, uh, hopefully that person will be open enough to really trying to get inside to the music emotionally and connect with that, you know? So um, I'm, I'm, I think it's most important to be 
uh, very empathetic, very wide open. That to me, that's what in the pocket means. And then once you find that vibe, whatever that is, that that indescribable feeling, that you, you, there's this unspoken sort of like, yeah, we're there. Let's 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 stay in there for a minute, you know. And that that's the beauty of making music, especially with uh, um, new musicians. Like if you're playing with musicians that you don't know that well. And you're just trying to learn each other and you know you just you're wide open paying attention to every single thing you're like okay they do that okay when this happens they go there all right so let me uh, and of course all this is on all of this is is on the spot it's on the fly so that's a great place to be it's just a little scary but i like that <laughs> I, I think it's amazing and it's amazing to witness and watch it unfold because you can really sense the attunement Right. Um, is what we call it, right? Is that your, I mean, mindfulness, for lack of a, a better description, is present moment to moment awareness without pushing away, pulling right. in and grasping and clinging to, or zoning out about without, yes. without any judgment. So it's really about attunement, paying attention in the now, in the now, in the now. It's not about like, woo, you know, getting lost in the clouds or being locked down. Right. That flexibility that you describe with, you know, your other bandmates, your other players, and especially with somebody new, necessarily makes you pay attention and you're responsive, but you're not really reactive. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Do you find that in this day and age, that's very difficult? I, I find that just in terms of talking with people, forget making music, just having everyday conversation with people, um, the rhythm of everyday life, I find that um, the willingness to be in the moment, um, the willingness to be in the moment seems to be more difficult for people now than ever before. I, I get that sense. And, and let me follow up on a question with that. Um, what makes you get that sense? Um, because I realized that while it is wise and necessary to always plan for the future, um, all you have is the moment. All you have is the moment. So why not fully enjoy the moment? Because, uh, that, that's really all you have, you know? So I find that, uh, oftentimes, uh, I mean, I, I go with it because it's important to be, I always remember this Bruce Lee phrase when he says, you know, be like water, you know, take the shape of whatever glass or whatever, whatever you're in, you know? And um, I, I think I've always both consciously and sub subconsciously have, have tried to live like that. Um, and so when I come across like, very controlling people or um, people who are dedicated to making sure things go exactly as they planned. I mean, I, I respect that. I, I respect that. But I feel that they're missing an opportunity to really let in the moment, which could make their plans even better, you know? So uh, people are all like, oh, Christian, you, you're so calm, you, you're so cool, you know, and you just, you're so open. And part of me is thinking, well, why is that unusual? <laughs> well, I, I love what you're saying. And I love the Bruce Lee, uh, you know, saying about the water. And, and, in, and that's exactly right. You know, sometimes we're vapor, sometimes we're ice, sometimes we're river, sometimes we're ocean. But the cloud isn't different from the ocean, isn't different from the wave, isn't different from the tide or the current. You know, like, it's all part of this whole big thing called all together. Yeah, but I think that what you describe, in my opinion, since you asked my, what I thought about it, I'll yeah. tell you, is um, people are afraid. People have allowed the fear and the shadow to sort of be all of who they think that they are or all of who they think that it is, meaning it, the gestalt of life, and right. aren't really uh, able to pin down a reassurance in this level of, uh, in 12-step language, you would say, turning it over or mm. 
the render or this uh, trust. Sometimes in religious language, you might use the word faith. Uh, you talk to rationalists, scientists, materialists, they don't want to hear that kind of language. But at the same time, there's a certain uh, inescapable, even the quantum physicists talk about, uh, you cannot pin down everything. When you get down to the, you know, splitting of the atom of the atom of the atom, you know, we as the observer, we influence that which we see, no matter no. what. So who you are bringing to the equation is a big part of the equation that's created. So if yeah. you live out of fear and you're trying to control everything, you're probably going to beget more of that than if you live out of this openness and this more trusting, faithful, curious place. Really, it's just a curious place. Yeah, right. Right, you, you're just curious about what your other guys are out there and women uh, who are musicians that are out there on stage with you that are doing. Well, you know, I think that there's another word I think that goes with curiosity and, and that's uh, fearlessness, you know? Um, all of my favorite musicians, uh, particularly people like, you know, say uh, uh, Herbie Hancock or, or, or Miles Davis, um, they were so unafraid to experiment. You know, sometimes those experiments, some went better than others, but they were okay with that. You know, it's, it's so important to be fearless. And um, uh, I think maybe life in general, uh, it's important to be fearless. You never, be, you, you never know what you can learn, what you can discover. Sure, you'll be disappointed, you'll be hurt, you'll be sad, but I think you'll ultimately be enriched for letting yourself go um, to the moment and, and, and having that fearlessness and that, and that curiosity, as you said. Well, I, I, and I love what you're saying and I, and I agree with you. And I think though a lot of folks, unlike all of the hours that you put in practicing on the base, practicing the double base, doing your practice in mindfulness, doing your practices, meditation and yoga, right. doing your yoga, it's doing whatever your practice is. In kirtan, it's chanting. It's whatever practice you want to choose. Music is a practice. Art is a practice. Poetry, writing, all these things are practices. But that a lot of folks aren't confident in their ability to practice what it is that would then bring them to a place of being fearless because we're talking about the human realm, the emotional realm, the re relational realm. Oftentimes they've been hurt early yeah. on by someone or something and once bitten twice shy and then that contraction comes and then it stays. Yeah. And they haven't figured out how to, how to open back up again because it was safe here and kept them surviving but now they're still there, and now they're kind of cut off from living that full, vibrant, curious, fearless life that you're talking about. Right, right. I wish I knew how, you know, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you would have a much better uh, answer to that than I would, because um, all, like everyone on this planet, I believe, I would think, uh, if you've lived to your mid-40s, you've had your heart broken at least once or twice, uh, you may have possibly broken one or two hearts, you know, if you live this long. Uh, you have lost people to death. Um, you know, we were talking right before we started recording, I, I lost my mother-in-law just a couple of days ago. Uh, my wife is, is taking it hard. Um, I lost both of my grandparents. I was super, super tight with my grandfather. We were like, you know, like that. And um, so when he died, this, this was, um, wow, it's, it's been six years already. Whew. Seems like yesterday. But, uh, you know, I've, I've lost so many people in my family, my grandparents, my uncles, um, you know, so it, I feel in many ways, it's just me and my mother and, and my dad, even though they're not together. Um, I have a few cousins, but they're kind of spread out all over the country. So uh, I've always had this sense of, of solitude, you know what I mean? Um, in a way, and, and also being an only child, um, I'm actually comfortable being in my own skin. I, I like being alone. Uh, I get energy from being alone. Um, not lonely, but alone, you know? Um, so I don't, to say all of that, you know, death, heartbreak, sadness, disappointment, um, I'm not sure 
what it would take for a person like you know what do you tell a person when they've had that sort of heartbreak like um once you heal you know time will heal you know get back on the horse and enjoy life in the moment still be fearless uh still be curious but i know it's it's a little diff it's more difficult for you know more more than others some more than others you know so i i don't I wish I knew what to say to, to people who have been hurt and who have really taken it um, hard, you know? Well, don't you think, I mean, one of the things that I've learned is um, that the greatest super that we have, the greatest superpower that we have is not that we ever control what ends up happening, the outcome, but that we control like what we put into it and how, yeah. we, and how we relate to it. So, it's within our control to shift that perspective to yeah. say, I can relate to this situation that's hard for me or difficult in a way that isn't contracted. Once I start to unlock it and can sit with myself, but there's some famous person, I don't remember their name, but basically they said something like, you know, the, the big problem with the human race is nobody can sit in a room by themselves for 10 minutes. <laughs> and, that, and that was said before all the internet and the phones and the right, and that's something. And that was that was said a long time ago. And yeah. and what you're saying is is you have this capacity that people who don't have it can build through meditation. I I, I would think so. I mean, I, I would I would think so. I mean, like I, reading your your book, um, I know you've you've experienced. Uh, some trials and tribulations. Yes. Um, you know, reading about some of the, reading about your relations, some of your relationships that they, they're actually kind of quite, quite humorous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find that poetry healed you? Was, was it able, were you able to kind of overcome that, that, that pain or that, that disappointment through your writing? I think it was one of the tools. I yeah. think writing and poetry, the way that I write it, narrative poetry, um, yeah. is, is definitely one of the ways in which I was able to start to make sense of my story. Um, yeah. if, you, if you talk about um, interpersonal neurobiology, attachment theory, neuroscientific research, all this psychological psychobabble, whatever, that is uh, relevant, they say that one of the biggest things to heal is that you need to have an integrated narrative of your life, meaning you need to be able to make sense of your own life for yourself right. in order to be able to live well, live fully, live in a more expansive way. And until you do that, when you have like blind spots and you know, you're kind of still trying to figure stuff out or you don't understand certain things, it can be difficult. So the poetry writing that you, wrote, that you read, which a lot of those books were written in 2004, quite some time ago, mm. I've come a long way in terms of now what I write about. And yeah. I do think that it was a critical part of my development and my healing in terms of talking about my breakup, talking about my relationship with my father, talking right. about uh, the relationship that I have with my mother, uh, because it's not about, again, what happens, but it's how I felt about it. My mother, right. loved yeah. Me, but yeah. we didn't have a perfect relationship. I know she loves me. Right. But we still have issues sometimes. And that's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I think that's the thing is, uh, it's been said we've, we've sort of tried to be in a comfort culture. We want everything to be 100% perfect and happy all the time. But instead of learning how to really live in our full range of human experience with the highs and lows of the joys and the sorrows, when, yeah. you, when you try to cut off the sorrow and you only try to live in the happiness, you end up with that tight fist. You, you need to have a slack hand. I mean, you know that from holding your bow and doing your thing. I mean, you cannot be clinging to anything. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. <laughs> you know, how, how are, you know, one thing I've always, uh, have always, I, I think about often is, when you get hurt or when you get disappointed, um, I, I, I've been burned um, quite a number of times, but I don't have it in me. I don't have revenge in me. Um, I've been told oftentimes that, you know, I need to do something to show this person that, you know, 
I'm not going to take that, you know. Um, I, I just have not been the kind of person that says, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, to me, I mean, I know that's in the Old Testament, but there's a New Testament, <laughs> you know. So um, how, how do you explain that sort of, you know, when people, hurt, when people are hurt, you know, or angry, they want to get revenge. They kind of just want to burn the whole house down. Does that really make you feel good in, in, in the end? Like once you calm down, I would always think that you look at it and go, oh my God, what have I done? I, I didn't mean to go that far, you know? Right, right. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that because you mentioned my books. And so a perfect example of that is, uh, you know, someone didn't like my first book. And so they threatened to sue the publisher. They shut it down. They stopped printing of the book and you couldn't buy it anymore because they didn't like it. And um, that was a real like revenge kind of an action and it had a lot of impact on me and my family and, and you know, a lot of different uh, people that I cared about and continues to have an impact in terms of, you know, uh, disruption relationships. Now, does that person, from what I've understood about this kind of character type or the reasons why people do things, why do they do that? Why does someone feel like they have to, you know, get revenge, so to speak, and, and, and why does someone else not have to feel that way? Well, it feels good in the moment, like you said, power, control, a sense of self-righteousness, a sense of, you know, sort of indignation, I've been wronged, and also one is often putting all of the sort of big bucket of pain that they have felt onto this one target that they feel mm. can now take it, right? Or it's an adaptive survival strategy, right? So like when someone's younger and they know that the only way that they're gonna be able to stay out at recess is if they throw the first punch or you know whatever, then they're gonna be the ones who's always in that sort of fighting stance, aggressive stance, like ready to run. Right, right. And so they see the world that way but the way you're saying that you see it is I have enough space that I can create room to say, this is wrong. I don't agree with what you did. Right. You hurt my feelings and I'm going to take the high road and find another way. Yeah. In the large scheme of things, I think what you're telling me is there's a sense, a deeper sense of being connected, interdependent, that that person has their own stuff they're working through. And, you know, you're not going to sit there and say to them, I need you to work it out for me. It's too bad you had to take it out on me. Right. But that, you know, it's for you to work out. You're in pain. Hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. This is true. I, I've always, the, the, the times where I have kind of retaliated or, done done something in that moment of you know i i would say anger but i'll say passion instead mm. um you know i'm talking like in my teens and, and 20s and things like that uh again once i've calmed down then i then i felt worse than i did when i was taking you know action you know and because what happened to me did not unhappen, you know, because it was still there. I just put that on that other person. And after a while, I was just like, man, I don't, man, I, I shouldn't have done that. So I, I've, I've kind of learned to, to try, always try to take the high road. Well, I love the long, that. To think the long term. You know? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a thing in, in Buddhism anyway called hiri and otapa, like shame and toxic shame, healthy shame, toxic shame. And there's a part of what we would call healthy shame, which is when you know that you want to do behavior that's like helpful to the tribe, helpful to keeping everybody cohesive, helpful to kind of getting along. You don't want to be shunned or whatever. And then there's toxic shame where you feel like not just I did a bad thing, but yeah. that I'm a bad person. And there's a big difference. And we have an affliction of people who have toxic shame. They just feel like they're not worth anything. And that drives a lot of outrageous, outburst kind of behavior. So what you felt by what I'm hearing you say is you kind of felt ashamed of yourself a little bit afterwards. And after a while, it teaches you, I don't really want to do that. It didn't get anywhere because it didn't fix the problem. It just added more toxicity out there. Yes, right, right. Just so made it worse. Yeah. So what's the point? Hey, I, by by the way, um, you know, my my wife 
has been uh, a Buddhist for, I don't know, 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought of myself as a spiritual person. I'm, I'm not a religious person, but I'm, I definitely believe in a, in a higher being, uh, whatever you may call him. I feel like all roads lead to this greater place uh, that we, we try to analyze and, and, and get a grasp of, but it's, it's too great for, for us to, to understand what that truly is. So whether you call him God or Jehovah or Allah, or whatever it is, I, I believe in the best of all of it, you know. Um, but I also think about um, who some of my favorite people have been to be around, like musicians. Um, and again, I must mention somebody like Herbie Hancock because he always seems, he's always positive. Um, Wayne Shorter. Wayne Shorter to me is probably, um, he he's one of the few people I've always wanted to be around, um, be, because he really is like a uh, you know he, he's a teacher. I and and not because he puts his arm around you and gives you these secrets of life, but uh, he always speaks metaphorically. He also has been a Buddhist for many many years, and when I think of some of the the tragedy he's had to deal with in his life, you know, losing his wife and his parents and, and one of his, his, his children, all to tragic circumstances. The fact that he can still be so, you know, you know, such a positive dude, I said, man, that's, there's something about him that all of us should seek. And uh, so with that being said, I started chanting uh, about six months ago. Hmm. And... Um, so I called up Herbie. I say, Herbie, guess what, man? Uh, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Herbie it was like, what? I said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> so uh, I'm finding such, um, such great joy in, in, in chanting and meanwhile still learning what I can and appreciating everything about other religions. You know, this, this is a big world, you know. Absolutely. And, and that's so cool. I mean, I, you know, I would have never expected you to say that right now, but now that I think about it, it's really not that surprising. Um, I, I think, yeah, I actually heard Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter back in the day. It was probably about 20 years ago when they were playing in Boston and they were just off on a trip. They were in another, yeah. band, you know, and I, I was like, wow, like I've never heard anything like this before. I mean, Miles did some stuff like that, but I, I, it was, it was definitely out of this world and yeah. uh, but back to the chanting and back to you know practice i don't quote unquote I, religion is not a thing to me uh the buddhist teachings or, or the Tao, or you know the way jesus lived or the way you know it's it's there's these are basic principles to me about truth kindness and compassion honesty action you know you reap what you right. sow you know, and, and the, the real affliction uh, that Buddhism points out is just that ignorance is the cause of suffering. So when you have a uh, wrong view, you're not able to see things clearly, mm -hmm. that's what ends up being the seat of hatred, anger, problems. You know, if you can see things clearly, like, listen, I don't care what skin color you are. I don't care whether or not you are this gender, that gender, you know, whatever. I don't care if you're yeah this class, socioeconomic, this or that, we are all in the same boat called humanity. When you get to that, come on now. That's being in the pocket. Talk, talk about a sister. <laughs> <laughs> come right. on with it now. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. But, I, but but that's but that's what I think it's so beautiful. So so a practice like chanting or even practicing for you or whatever, you can do something that gets you more, I think, it they call it sati, mindfulness means remembering. It's reconnecting, it's recollecting into yourself who you are. Who am I? How right. do I feel? What am I, how am I vibrating? Literally, yeah. if you're chanting right now. And it makes the person not hate themselves so much because they're not pushing themselves away from themselves. They're forced to just be with themselves for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a very, um, that's, I think that's healthy to, to be that way, you know, to always be proactive about uh, asking that question, who am I? Looking at yourself, 
uh, accepting it. You know, I, I, we're human beings, so we're obviously flawed. Um, but as long as you're aware of those flaws and you try to work on those flaws and always try to continue the strengths that you know you have, I would think you're setting yourself up for a pretty um, good life, you know what I mean, for yourself and, to, and for, uh, for other people around you. You know, I wish I could, uh, when I see so much anger going on in our country right now, um, everybody is intensely mad about something. Um, while I certainly understand it, uh, when I think about all of the uh, uh, social imbalances and, and, and wrongs in this country, uh, they've been there for hundreds of years, in some cases, thousands of years. Um, but I feel this sort of, this intense separation of groups and camps and the sort of takedown culture and people using the people using social media for pure negativity. Um, I think the sort of spun out of control. And I think it's because, uh, rolling it all the way back to what you talked about with, with fear, you know, um, I wish there was a way that I could put my arm around everybody and be like, hey, my manager and I always talk about the, you met, you remember Andre. Yeah. Um, we talked about that scene in Do the Right Thing where, where Samuel Jackson comes up in the screen. And he's like, hold up, time out. Y'all take a chill, right? <laughs> so I, I wish I could stand in the middle of the unit, well, at least in the middle of America and be like, yo, Hold up. <laughs> totally. But you know. That's exactly right though, because it's it's one's ability to just press pause that yeah. we practice in ourselves. Yes. Could be with your wife, with your kid, with your boss, with your coworker, with your friend. When we press pause in ourselves, that's the beginning of change. Yep. Start small. I mean, you know, you got big arms and I got big arms and we can try to do hands across America, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, we can try. And, 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 and in my heart, I do try. And I know you do too, um, especially with your music, especially even around the world, because you're traveling to Europe next week or whatever. So, you know, you're, you're off and running with it. Because I do think that back to your music, that is a universal way of connecting people and of showing people that there are people who look different, that people have different backgrounds, that you can still appreciate something so profound as this uh, really masterpiece being created before your eyes that you alone are the only one that will ever really witness because it cannot be reproduced. Mm. Dig it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, okay, so let's just stay with the political thing then, because you said back in 1997, uh, you did a Bill Clinton town hall, racism in the performing arts, and uh, then you composed uh, the, the movement as a tribute to Rosa Parks, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, and Dr. Martin Luther King, whose uh, anniversary of his assassination is tomorrow. Yes. Talk to me. You'll be playing in Worcester, Massachusetts, where I'm from, Massachusetts. Um, talk to me about Black Lives Matter, the state of racism in America, what you feel about what's happening right now, and do you have a role in it? And if so, what is it? Uh, Yes, I do have a role in it, like everyone. What that is, I don't quite know. I think maybe it could change on a a daily basis. It it can morph into different things on a daily basis. Uh, Again, I just try to be very open to accept what that role has to be at that particular time. Um, Yes, there's a lot of, uh, again, there's a lot of social injustices out there that have been going on for many, many years. Um, I'm, when it comes to social injustices, it's it's a very, hmm, how, how can I put this? It's so systemic, right? Um, I'm all about specific. I'm about pinpointed uh, specificity. 
uh, uh, I think that's the right word. Now, it's going to be very difficult for me in an angry state to change your mind, to get you to change who you are as a person. If you don't like me because of my color or my background or whoever I am, you have your own fears that you have to deal with. And you're in a position to sort of set up my life or, or set up my culture. There's a couple ways to go about this. Um, I could either try to say, hey, you know what? What you're doing is, is harming me. Can we talk about this? You know, uh, the problem is there are many that say, we've tried that already for hundreds of years and it doesn't work. So you have to fight this force with a greater force. Um, I often wonder if that will ever get us what we deserve and what we need. I, I, I'm sort of a, a, a scholar of the civil rights movement. At least I, I think I am. Um, there's, there's a couple of people who have always been very important to me, uh, and, and for very specific reasons. Uh, when I think of Rosa Parks, uh, when I think of somebody like Whitney Young, when I think of somebody like Harry Belafonte, uh, I know when we talk about the civil rights movement, sort of the same names sort of come up It's it's always King, you know, King is sort of like the the umbrella figure uh, and like sort of like on the other, on the other end of the spectrum, there was Malcolm X, uh, Ma Malcolm X slash nation of Islam, you know, uh, the sort of take action. Um, let's stop asking people to give us what we deserve. Let's just build our own nation. Um, whereas King was sort of taking the Gandhian approach of, of peace and, uh, but I, I think about what real significant things happened in the 50s and the 60s and how they happened. Um, when I think of Rosa Parks not w refusing to sit in the back of the bus and consequently being arrested, um, I love the fact that that whole community came together and said, you know what, the real way to make change we're talking about a we're talking about a a uh, a civil right here, you know, like a, a a city ordinance that is a law that blacks can't sit in the front of the bus. Let's just not ride that bus anymore. We're going to boycott. We're going to hit them in the pocket where it hurts. They need us. They need our business. This transportation company takes black people all over the city to work, and if we don't ride that bus, we're going to walk. We're going to carpool. We're going to do whatever we need to do. That's when they went, oh, man, we need to change this law. Yo, oh, man, it's hitting us in the pocket, you know, and that's where it counts. <laughs> you know, we're talking business here. Let's hit them in the pocket, you know. Um, I think of somebody like Whitney Young being like when the, when the, in the, in the mid-60s, when things really started to get to a fever pitch, you had sort of the, the radical you know, the sort of Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, H. Rap Brown sort of scene. And then you had King and the peace movement. Well, who was in the middle? And I think of somebody like a Whitney Young, who was all about business. Uh, Whitney Young says, listen, there are some black geniuses out there, male and female, who need some jobs. Uh, he was the one who got a lot of black people into the boardroom at major companies like Xerox, uh, 3M, things like that, when, when nobody was thinking about that, you know. Um, and I know he caught a lot of heat, you know, people saying, oh, you know, you, you're pandering to, to these white folks. And Whitney Young was like, no, I'm trying to get black folks into these higher uh, uh, positions, of power. We need to train them so they can come in here and work in these big companies. Um, and I always think that um, he was a very, very important person in that he was able to sort of see above the fray of the anger and say, listen, this is what we need to do. And, and therefore, there were a whole generation of 
of, of black people who now had the benefit of having jobs at major companies because there was somebody who was able to go see above the anger, you know? And I think some real significant change happened there. Uh, so I think, I'm, I'm sorry this has taken so long, but no, no, in, in, in today's world, there's so much anger. I just, nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna get done because of that. I, I think of the, the march against, you know, uh, the, the march on Washington. Um, that was not a general march. It was not a, a general uh, march. Uh, I, I mean, I think there were some people who were angry who decided they were going to join that, that march. But that was a very specific march. Uh, the March on Washington for, for jobs and freedom, you know. Um, and I think that with all of the many movements that are going on right now, from Black Lives Matter, Time's Up, Me Too, all of the anger that is building in our culture right now, um, I, I hope at some point we can let some, some, some thoughtfulness uh, come over that anger so real change can occur. I read somewhere that um, you know, s scaring people or sort of forcing people to, uh, I wish I could remember what this quote was, but it, it was pretty, it was pretty deep that, uh, you know, if you, once people aren't scared anymore, then you got, then, then you really have a problem. Right. Um, so I think that everybody's angry. Everybody's really ticked off right now. And, something really, really unfortunate is going to happen. There's going to be some innocent, lot more innocent lives uh, at stake. Um, and I just wish there could be some thoughtfulness that will somehow overcome. I, we, we need people to actually think about, okay, what are we doing here? What is it that, what, what is it specifically that we want? And I mean, very specific, um, be it atmosphere in the workplace, be it, uh, um, police reform, I'm definitely all for that, you know. Um, and I got friends who are cops, too, and I'm like, yo, I can talk to you. We're friends. Uh, you, you, we need to talk about police reform. And, and many of them agree with me. You know, they say, yes, cops need to be retrained, you know. Um, uh, women in the workplace, you know. I, I see men do things sometimes, and, and I go, what really you know um that can't happen you know what i mean so um but there's so much anger right now i i i i just wonder if uh some real intelligent thought is going to have to take over some, some empathy some sympathy some some mixture of channeling that anger into real change well, I, I really think, you know, you said- Sorry that. I took so long. <laughs> no, no, it's all, don't apologize. We're having a conversation. That's great. Um, you know, I appreciate it because you, it was a thoughtful comment and commentary. And what we're really, what you're describing is mindfulness, being mindful. You're saying being thoughtful, but mindful is being, you know, sort of cognizant of uh, the impact of what you're doing and always wanting to do something out of compassion, you know, uh, as opposed to out of fear and out of greed. Right. You know, you know, now it's not that people can't be, you know, capitalists have a, you know, good opportunity, that kind of stuff. Uh, but the problem is greed. How much do you need? How far does it have to go? To what? Right. To what extent? Where does it end? When can we share? I mean, we teach our children, you know, share with your friends, share the pie, share the cake, share the cookie. You know, little kids, research has shown time and time again, they give their friend the cookie or the pie or the little, you know, piece of chocolate or whatever it is. They want to do that uh, naturally. It's not in our, we're, we're not born being so takers, greedy, all me, me, me. And we're not born with that kind of fear, but something along the way gets messed up and then people end up being, like you say, uh, dysregulated and then unable to kind of 
uh, you know, unlock from that. So that thoughtfulness and that intelligent conversation uh, is really a big part of it. And I think that when you talk about economics, look at what uh, Jay-Z and Sean Combs are doing with their new, uh, you know, venture to try and get more people to be uh, tapping into black owned businesses and, and that kind of a thing. I think that that's an interesting approach uh, to yeah. trying to do your Andrew Young, you know, um, or Whitney Young, sorry. Whitney and, Young, yeah. Yeah. But Andrew, Andrew Young was bad too, though. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm missing, I'm missing my civil rights leaders here. But, um, but I think that that's another way to try to highlight stuff. But I think the main thing, and I've, ta I've taken just personally some implicit bias classes lately because of my own ethnic background. You know, I've told many people, I just had my DNA test done, like, exactly, right? It tells me, like, 70% European, 20% African, and, like, 10% Arabic or something. I'm like, right. okay, whatever. That what I hear again and again is that because for people of dominant culture, dominant race, dominant ethnicity, that, that dominant gender, that there's sort of a sense of I have to give up what I have in order for someone else to right. have what they need. Right. And the problem is, is that too much in many cases was given or taken, I should say, in one side of the equation for so long that in order to share, there can be a way to create a greater abundance. Absolutely. But it, but it can't be like either or me or you. And that's where you're talking about the hatred and the anger. Right. It doesn't have to be that kind of energy. It could be the energy of let's work together and build it out. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm with you all the way on that. You know, I, I, um, where, don't, don't you think intent is also very important? Like, I, I, I'll tell you why I say that because, um, I think laughter is very important. I think that's something that uh, a lot of us have lost in um, in today's culture. I think even comedy is angry now. Um, many times when I listen to modern day comedians, it almost sounds like a political rally, which I'm, I'm I get it, but there's a part of me that was like, you know, I really want to laugh. You know, I think about people like. Uh, uh, a George Carlin or Richard Pryor, uh, who could really take the um, the cultural and social absurdities and make real humor out of it, as opposed to ranting, you know. And um, I always bring up this this story about my mother because uh, my mother is. Um, my mother's so down. She is a total soul sister, West Philadelphia. You know, I mean, she is all about power to the people, right? Um, you know who one of my mother's favorite comedians always was? Was Don Rickles. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a funny one, yeah. But it used to trip me out because, like, here's my very socially progressive mother on the floor rolling, hollering every time Don Rickles would like talk about, you know, have these racially, like now they would be called racially insensitive. But like, boy, Don Rickles would start making these black jokes and Puerto Rican jokes and, and, and Jewish jokes. And my mother would be rolling on the floor, dying. And once I got older and started to understand some of the nuances of what Don Rickles was saying, I used to think, why was my mother laughing at that? That's, ooh, that's, that's kind of, ooh. You know, I was like, mom, why do you love Don Rickles so much? She was like, because he's funny. <laughs> you know, his intent was not to hurt, you know? Yeah. And I say, you know, that, that's very important. I, and I think uh, people are losing focus of, of intent now, you know? I, I think uh, uh, somebody like a Don Rickles, um, uh, making fun of every ethnicity in the world. Uh, yeah, and nowadays you couldn't get away with a lot of that. And I do think that there was uh, a sort of an old school entitlement to a lot of his humor. Um, 
But at the same time, like you look at Don Rickles, how that sort of brand of humor evolved from the 50s through the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to his death. Uh, it didn't really change all that much because I think Don Rickles was like, you know, do you really think I'm trying to insult you or harm you by making fun of you? That's what comedy is supposed to be, you know? So I, I think intent is something that uh, many people um, don't focus on. It's, it's now a very black and white sort of, you can don't say this, don't say that, don't do this, don't do that. And if you do it, that's a one strike and you're out, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, uh, I find people are really apologizing for a, a lot these days. You know, some they need to, but maybe some they don't. Yes, I think that there's a lot to what you just said. And I think that, um, again, from the mindfulness perspective, we look at our intentions deeply and we look at what is the deepest intention. And we talk about marbled intention sometimes. So sometimes right. we say we're wanting to do one thing, but we're actually like driven by some conditioned behavior. Right even deeper so yeah. it's like looking at that and going in with the microscope you know sometimes we need the telescope sometimes we need the microscope and so like it's like well is that really my intention is that really all i meant or is there something else going on that i don't even know or am i speaking out of a place that is a place of privilege or a place of ignorance or is it really just that understanding that we're part of this collective I pick on myself in the same way that I poke the holes in you. That's yeah. a different, you know what I'm saying? Right, That's right. not subjugating. You're still right. here. You know what I mean? As long as you're doing this, we're good. When you start doing this, we're not so good. I, I lost you for that. For that, I knew I, knew I was that doggone it. You, you mind saying that one more time? I'm sorry. No, that's okay. No, I just said as long as we're doing this, meaning that we're on the same page. Yes. I can make fun of myself in much the same way that I'm going to make fun of your, you or your thing or whatever it is, then we're good. But when we start being mean, the bully right. or the, that's the intent. Bullies no. have the intention of subjugating yeah. and of controlling and of trying to pull the power from the situation to make themselves feel good. Last week, I just did an interview with somebody on narcissism. She was an expert on narcissists. That makes them feel good when they put other people down. That's not what we're after. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I never got that. But our society is, for a lot of reasons, rewarding of that kind of behavior. Yeah, who do you have in mind when you say that? <laughs> 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 Wouldn't it happen to be that? Nah, I ain't gonna go there. No, well, you know, and females can be narcissists too, and some of them are very successful in. Uh, yes, business. yes, and um, yeah, I, I do think uh, American culture has a very quiet admiration for narcissists. You know, uh, I I don't get it. I, I I often wish I could be one because they seem to have a lot of fans. <laughs> they have a lot of support, but um, I think maybe as a male in in my 20s, you know, I, I think most people in their 20s, uh, that's a, a great period to be a narcissist, you know, um, but I like to think that I, I, I've evolved from that because uh, uh, I like thinking about other people, you know, I, I'm I'm human. I screw up sometimes. I get screwed over sometimes, but it's all cool, you know, because I, I try to think, you know, look, just talk to the person. If something's not going the way you want it to go, if you feel wronged, if you feel hurt, just come at me. Yeah, look, I need to rap to you about this, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, that is but so there's no need to be selfish or, or narcissistic or, or scared or, or bullying or, or hurting people. Uh, as sort of your modus operandi, you know. But that means that you have a strong sense of self underneath it all, that you can admit that you can make mistakes and that sometimes your actions, even though you may have a certain intention that you thought was good, may end up not, you know, right. so well, and that you take responsibility for it and that you go in after the rupture 
to repair. Right. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. They've yeah. only ever learned that if there's a rupture, then that means that you're now my enemy or I'm now persona non grata for you or whatever. And I think that as a culture, we do need to teach people to come together more and men, especially to be honest, to have more of a full range of their own human experience. Because as I understand it, I am not a man, but I have experienced dealings with many men and you are not generally speaking as encouraged to allow yourself to have this full range of human emotions. I agree. I absolutely agree. You know, phrases like, you know, man up. Um, we, we, we're going to make a man out of you. You know, um, we need to readdress what the, what, what those phrases mean. You know, um, I can remember in, in middle school, we had a gym teacher. Uh, he used to actually punch the guys in the chest to toughen them up. You know, <laughs> um, terrible. We we kind. I laugh at it now, just kind of remembering like what that was. You know, he's like, uh, "What's up, McBride?" Boom. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's like, "Come on, we're gonna man you up." You know. So what does that? What exactly did that mean? You got to be able to take physical pain. You got to be able to dish out physical pain. You got to kind of have like, you know, you go, you know, so is that what it means to be a man? I don't, I don't think so. So you then know? what does it mean to be a man? Well, certainly now uh, we are readdressing what that means. I think you nailed it to really understand that we need to pay it. We need to focus on our wide range of emotions and be in touch with those emotions that we're not supposed to be in touch with, you know, uh, be it empathy or sympathy or, or, or I, I actually think it's hard for men to actually be in love, you know, even with love, there's a certain filter that is sort of like, well, I have to be the strong one. You know, we've always been taught that, um, you know, you know, women are not in control of their emotions. So we have to be the ones to balance that out. You know, we, we've always been taught that, you know, women are the ones that will fly off the handle. Uh, 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 if there's really a one, they'll take it as a six. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so be the rock to kind of balance that out. I'm not sure if that's really wise because I think it's a human trait that, if no, whether this male or female, if someone's doing this and somebody's doing this, maybe now if the person does this and this person does that, you get this now, you know? So if, if men are always deciding that they have to be here under all circumstances and women are kind of always kind of doing this for lack of a better, uh, movement. I feel you. Yeah. Maybe if a man does a little bit more of this, then it becomes more of this, you know, a little more balance. So um, men have to really be aware of um, really checking in with all of their emotions and how that affects uh, everything around us, you know. I think that's so valuable. And I know that there are programs and, you know, places where people can do that. But that generally speaking, as a society, we're still often conditioned to not do that and to not have yes. people uh, be able to do that. But that, 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 that I think we're seeing the repercussions of that in terms of our climate, in terms of, you know, uh, domestic terrorism, in terms of international wars, in terms of, uh, you know, continued, continued suffering where there needn't be so much of it. Yeah. Pain will happen. Things will happen. But that there's um, sort of that, that there's a way to come together. And I know that uh, some folks have said that we don't have any rituals for men in our country anymore. You know, all of more indigenous peoples or tribes or in years past, you know, from all across the world, whether it's Western Europe or anywhere, uh, you know, that there were more rituals in terms of coming of age and what it meant to know how to be strong when it required being strong and know how to be more yielding when that right. was that the yielding is a strength, but it's a, a quiet strength. It's not a dominant strength. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, and I, I worry that um, the person who's in charge of uh, our law and order 
um, is really doing, <clears throat> he's, he's blatantly doing the exact opposite of what will prevent terrorism. And what he believes is a problem in our country. He's doing the exact wrong thing that he believes will, like the, the whole thing of building a wall, the whole thing of, you know, all of this whole, this Russia stuff, this North, Northern Korea stuff, you know, he, he's, he's a tough guy, you know, and again, Somehow people like that. They think they're watching John Wayne on television. You know, they think they're watching Bruce Willis and Die Hard. That's not what we're watching. Those were fictional characters. You know, um, a lot of his actions, I didn't say who. I just said, you know, the guy in charge of our law and order. Um, he's doing the exact wrong thing on all of these uh these issues because he's making people angrier. He's just making people more angry on both sides because now people, his supporters are getting riled up like, yeah, that's right. So they're indignant, they're angry. And the people who are on the other end are like, oh no, no, hell no, we're mad too. You know, so it's like, and I think he's sitting above it all like laughing and giggling and twiddling his thumbs and playing everybody just like that, you know? And yeah. we fall for the bait. Yeah, and I think that to not fall for the bait is definitely uh, one of the things that people can do is stay sane and to do a certain amount of, um, you know, self-inquiry, self-care, self-centering. And I really mean that in a way of not, not being active. I feel like engagement is definitely uh, required and necessary and having Absolutely. conversations, but also like really honoring, you know, when they say in yoga, namaste, it's I see yes. the light in you, the divine light, whatever it is that's in me, that's in you, that everything and everyone is made of, including the folks that are misguided or including the folks who take very destructive paths of action that impact negatively a lot of people for generations even, that there is still a part of the core of that person or of that nature that is just obscured by so much other stuff that it can't be seen. So right. try and find that place and that person and work with as opposed to work against. Because rightly so, I think a lot of people who are angry on both sides, all people, right? Uh, all good people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there, are, there are all kinds of people who are angry for a lot of different reasons. And I just finished reading a book by Michael Kimmel, who I'm interviewing next week, who's a sociologist over at uh, Stony Brook, who wrote a book called Angry White Men. And he talks about how a lot of the rural farmers in America were uh, suicidal in the 80s when uh, the trade agreements changed. A lot of right. people didn't have any income so they're they're angry appropriately but the direction of the placement of the anger is not really appropriate yes and so how do we then heal the wounds and attend to the wounds that are on both sides right or on all sides uh in order to get to a place where people can actually be centered enough in themselves to then have the conversation about let's build this something you know together, and uh, I mean not to say kumbaya and all of that, but yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I, I do think that it's 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 a challenge, and I think music is one of the ways to do it. So we've been on the phone for a long time, and I want to just um, mention that you are going to be in uh, New York after you go to you know Boston tomorrow or Worcester tomorrow at Dizzy's Club Coca Cola for a two week run, and you mentioned that you are going to be having on stage with you Elizabeth Alexander, who is the poet who wrote praise song for the day in January 2009 for uh, Barack Obama's inauguration. So talk to me about what that is about and how that came about. Yeah, you know, I've known Elizabeth for 20, almost 26 years now. We did a thing, we first met at a jazz and poetry concert at the 92nd Street Y in the early 90s. And uh, we just, we've been in touch all these years and we've, you know, she's inspired me with her writing. And, you know, when I saw her at the inauguration, I was just like, yo! And uh, she was just recently named as the uh, CEO of the Mellon Foundation. And so uh, 
my my wife and I went to the uh, big re uh, VIP reception just uh, just last week, I believe it was, and uh, <laughs> I pulled her on the side, and I, I was like, "Isn't this sort of antithetical to your uh, creativity? Are you still going to write?" <laughs> you know? uh, she's like, "No, no, no, don't worry, I'm going to write." So um, I thought that with this band that I'm working with, the Dizzy's, my new quartet, which is called the New John, with some Philly slang there. Um, I say you should come up and sit in, and uh, and and do a read. You know, I'm, I've I've been working a lot with the with the great Sonia Sanchez. Um, we we did a thing together at Carnegie Hall last month, and uh, so I'm very much into working with poets. You know, and uh, from Sonia Sanchez to Elizabeth Alexander uh, to to yourself. You know, um, and it's always inspiring. You know, so uh, yeah, she's gonna come sit in with us on Sunday. That's great. I I love it, and um and you know I really love the fact that you are interested in using art as a way to extend the conversation because frankly, a lot of the folks that will come to that kind of a, a an audience, a place, you know, they're people from all walks of life. They're people of every color, of every ethnic background, of every socioeconomic club. I mean, jazz is a universal language in that way. That's right. That's absolutely right. And uh, Francesca, you know, I, I got to tell you one thing that's very inspiring, talking with you and, and people like you. Um, I realize that at the end of the day, you, you, you have to be, you have to be the person that, uh, you have to be the example, you know, um, whatever you want to see in life, you have to be that. And uh, people like Wayne Shorter, people like Herbie Hancock, people like yourself, people who I love being around. Uh, you, it's something that all of you guys do that's, that, that's very simple. And that's, you send out good energy, just good vibes. You know, whatever is, whatever is out there and all this fray, even if you can't really get all of your conscious thoughts together to kind of deal with this crazy place, you just, is simply put out good energy. Just put out the energy to, you know, to counterbalance all this other energy out there. You know what I mean? So thanks for putting out good energy. That is so, um, so great of you to say. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I have to say the same to you. And, and you know, it's been, I will say, uh, as we close, uh, that I was my own worst enemy, if you will, in preventing me from putting out more of that sooner, you know? Um, and yet at the same time, I wouldn't have the depth of whatever the perspective is that I've come to had I not kind of gone through some of those trials and tribulations. And, uh, you know, I'm just grateful that we can have this kind of a conversation that you share the way that you do, that you create, and that you continue to inspire people the way that you do. And um, I'll come check you out, uh, you know, over in uh, Lincoln Center uh, coming up. And who knows, maybe I'll swing by with a poem or two. Hey, do it. <laughs> do it. Come on up and get some. <laughs> all right my dear have a great trip to boston tomorrow and um again thank you so much for your time this was a great conversation on wise girl it, it was it was so my pleasure to speak with you and catch up it's, it's been a long time and i'll see you at dizzy's i will i will promise okay. all right my friend bye, -bye be cool now all right you too take care bye